right. All right. Well, I'd like to welcome you all along to the Run Faster, Run Stronger webinar. Um, we're really looking forward to going through hopefully some really useful, relevant information for you all on running. Um, we're really, really fortunate to have some really, really interesting people um, to provide some terrific information for you. We've got Nathan, the conditioning consultant, uh, and we've got Renee and Brad from the running company uh, to chat to us a little bit about uh, running footwear. So who am I? Um, we are, we are Melbourne Podiatry Clinic. So I'm Andrew from Melbourne Podiatry Clinic. Um, we have clinics in uh, Essendon and Blackburn. Um, I'm a really keen runner. I love running, hence um, the sort of the passion, um, I guess, to chat to everyone and um, help uh, runners uh, help uh, achieve your goals. Um, I've completed a few marathons and a couple of Ironmans and uh, really love probably more the longer distance. Trail running is my, my favourite. Um, as a clinic, we do focus on runners. We love working with runners of all levels from uh, elite to those just starting out running. So really, uh, we, we're really interested in people who love running. Uh, it doesn't really matter what your ability is. Um, and all of us at the clinic love running. We love running footwear. It's one of our passions and we love helping people achieve their running goals. So if anyone's coming in saying, I've got this event coming up, we love to hear about it and we love to obviously help get you there. Um, please feel free, um, I'll give this email again, but if, if you do have any questions either from this evening or anything uh, running, foot, shoe, lower limb related, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, my email is at andrew at melbournepodiatryclinic.com.au. So tonight uh, we're gonna go through, the main focus is gonna be going through training principles with Nathan and I'll introduce him in a moment. Basically, we're going to try, he's going to go and understand or help you understand um, how to improve your running performance by uh, your training program um, and hopefully also helping you reduce uh, your risk of injury or help you manage injuries better. Um, I'm going to just discuss a little bit on running assessment and what it is and how it can help and also just touch on a little bit about running technique. And then we're going to chat all things footwear with the crew from Running Company. I'm really excited to see what uh, the latest developments are with footwear uh, at the moment. So the Running Company have really kindly donated some awesome prizes. Um, so they've donated um, some, a $200 and $100 shoe voucher, obviously that you can go in and spend the time with them, get fitted and get yourself a new pair of running shoes. Uh, a lucky participant will also have the opportunity to have a full video running gait assessment to obviously discuss what's going on with your running technique and look at any running technique changes if required. We've also got um, some Steigen running socks, so they're great anti-blister socks um, as for people with uh, questions uh, or if we, we're going to be, I guess, putting out, getting a bit of uh, involvement from you guys. Um, so please... Uh, provide us with some great answers or questions um, or we'll send some um, prizes your way. So to win uh, the prizes, all you have to do is we're gonna be putting up letters throughout the webinar. Write the letters down as they pop up. Um, at the end, when we get to the last letter, we'll ask you to tell us what the word spells. So just pop it in the chat box um, and spell out the word um, and we'll, we'll work that out and be in touch with you in the next couple of days. So without further ado, here's the first letter. Let's make sure you write that down. Uh, for all patients or for all uh, guests uh, uh, and attendees of the webinar, we are offering uh, a new patient offer. Um, if you haven't been to see us before um, and you've got something that you'd like to have a bit of a look at, you've got an injury or a niggle that you are unsure what's causing it, um, we're offering an exclusive offer, uh, a no gap assessment uh, if you've got health cover or $59. Uh, if you don't, we will basically get you on the treadmill, have a, have a detailed chat about, you know, you can tell us what your injury is, why it's occurring, so give you some ideas on how to fix it 
and give you some, hopefully a plan to stop it from coming back. All you have to do is just mention the webinar. If you give us a call or book an appointment online, just mention that you've attended the webinar uh, and you'll be eligible for that. So it gives you an opportunity to come and um, I guess discuss what is going on with your running. Um, so if you do want to take that offer up, just let us know and we can certainly organize that for you. So the main reason why we've decided to sort of put this webinar together is that because of COVID, we've seen a lot of people start running, which we think is fantastic. And we're a little bit biased. We love running. Um, but uh, what we have been finding is that a lot of people are running because, look, let's face it, for a period there, it was the only thing really you could do with gyms being closed. So a lot of people were running with perhaps not the tools, not the information about how they should be going about running. And what we were seeing in the clinic was that a lot of people were coming in with somewhat, sometimes quite serious injuries after a very short period of running. Um, we were seeing a number of stress fractures and tendon injuries that often we wouldn't see after some length, you know, after some months of um, regular running. So we, on the back of that, we were, we thought, look, let's try and help as many people as we possibly can by uh, giving them some simple advice on how they can be structuring their running program to hopefully avoid these injuries from occurring in the first place. Um, and this stat I find is really interesting is that it's estimated that 60% of all running injuries are due to training errors. So basically the way that you construct your weekly program, weekly, monthly program uh, contributes to the vast majority of the injuries that you're occurring. And most of the injuries we're seeing are overuse injuries in running and therefore the overuse part can be um, worked on um, by creating a, a better program. And that's why we've, we've got uh, Nathan Heaney involved, who really is an expert in this area. Um, with his background, he's got uh, a vast um, uh, experience in, to be able to basically help you work out what the fundamentals are when putting your running program together. Here's the second letter. Again, make sure you write that down. So that was E by the way. Um, so without uh, any further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Nathan Heaney. Uh, Nathan is a strength and conditioning coach. Uh, he's a high performance specialist, lecturer and consultant. He's worked at the Victoria Institute of Sport, AFL Victoria, the Adelaide Crows in their fitness department, and he's currently at Xavier College in their high, high performance area. Basically, he founded uh, the conditioning consultant to basically make high performance training principles accessible to people of all levels. So people who normally would have to be in a, an institute of sport to be receiving this level of, I guess, experience um, and uh, programming um, he's basically able to make this available to, to anyone. Um, and it's a really amazing service. And I can certainly vouch for that I have done running with Nathan and the detail that he puts into his running programs. And I must admit, I'd never run better under his program uh, is amazing. So I really do. Um, I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. Um, and his big focus is on improving performance, uh, but also obviously helping reduce injury rate. So I'll hand over to Nathan um, I'll just stop share, Nathan, if yep, you want to just share your screen and you can uh, <clears throat> kick us off. Sorry, can you just make me host, please? Sure. Okay, Andrew, you can, okay. Cool. So um, thank you, Andrew, for the opportunity to present as part of this webinar. And obviously, thank you to everyone for their attendance. Um, certainly much appreciated. Um, I guess the one thing I'll add to Andrew's, Andrew's intro is that obviously I've been fortunate enough to work in high performance settings for a long period of time now. So sort of nigh on 15 years. Um, but the one thing I guess uh, I've always probably realized, uh, particularly over the last five or so years, there is, um, I guess, a dearth of understanding regarding conditioning principles, um, 
both within um, the, the strength and conditioning and sports science um, space. So with practitioners and coaches and, and sometimes athletes as well. But um, really uh, stark for me was um, how limited the knowledge was for, I guess, recreational runners. So um, hence, I sort of started the conditioning consultant um, uh, with a few prompts from my wife who thought it would be a good idea. Um, so it certainly increased the workload, but it's certainly been a really enjoyable experience. And I've met some amazing um, individuals and runners along the way. Okay. Um, so just an overview of what I'll cover. So what type of running do most people complete? So that's a really important contextual question. Uh, common training mistakes, training intensity distribution and training polarization. So that'll tie into, um, I guess, the, the TCC and, and, and my philosophy. Um, and then why intent, why, and then I'll also cover why is high intensity interval training a, a really useful training method. Um, so what type of running do most people complete? And I think as Andrew has alluded to in the slide there, um, feel free to answer in the chat box what you think is the most common conditioning type. Um, so this is an example. So this is someone's actual data from, um, from Strava. Um, I happened to look at the participant, participant list and I, I did notice that they're, they're uh, actually in the webinar tonight. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to name them, but um, this is an example of, I guess, what most people tend to do. So um, when we look at this, uh, when we look at this particular um, uh, graph here, we're, we're sort of looking at um, three runs. So uh, the one thing they've done quite well is they've run on every other day. But one thing you can't help but notice is just how consistent uh, the runs are. So basically there is a one meter different, differential. So they've obviously run the same course over five days. They've run it at um, the following paces, 438 average, 441 and 440. So uh, essentially when you, when you look at this, the, 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 the session is in its entirety is a continuous or steady state run and it's been completed at a moderately hard intensity. So the reason I know it's a moderately hard intensity is because uh, when I started working with this particular individual, which was a referral from, from Andrew at Melbourne Podiatry Clinic, um, I was able to analyze his data and started to obtain like a, a really good assessment of his aerobic fitness. So then I knew exactly how hard he was working in these particular runs. And essentially it fits right in this moderately hard intensity. Now it is, absolutely common so certainly this individual wasn't alone this is the most common running that most people do so uh, i'll expand on um i guess uh, uh, i guess an alternate option a little bit later in the in the presentation or the webinar but one thing i will point is there's some particular issues that arise when you spend a lot of time on training uh like this so the first one is is training monotony so by training like this there is high levels of monotony in your training. So one of the one, one of the issues is like, so when most people start running and obviously Andrew's sort of highlighted that there's a bit of an influx in, in people taking up running, there's obviously that enthusiasm that's quite palpable for people. Um, that can quickly wane uh, when you're doing the same thing all the time. So high levels of training monotony when people train like this. Second issue is performance stagnation. So your body is amazing at reverting to homeostasis so essentially what that means is it'll only adapt and change when it's forced to so one of the key points with conditioning prescription or just physical activity training in general whether it be running or strength training um, you need to provide some component of progression or variety in your program to to keep inducing the the desired adaptations and improvements so if you continue training like this there is an element of performance stagnation that occurs and that can lead to frustration as well. So people, people sort of get demotivated because they're not improving anymore. And those newbie gains they did experience certainly a, a, a sort of a long evaporated. Um, so they, so they, they end up sort of losing motivation. And the third one, which is probably the most um, concerning really is injury. So this is someone's actual um, Strava profile. So for those of you that have used Strava before, this is a pretty familiar site. So you're looking at, uh, I guess, uh, someone's um, running profile or how much running they have done over the past four months. The one thing I want to point out here is that it is very inconsistent. So that, that should be pretty obvious for you. The reason it's inconsistent is that there were three injuries that occurred across this journey. So 
what we what what happens here is by virtue of training like they did so in this moderately hard zone all the time with high monotony very little recovery interspersed in the actual runs they ended up um, inducing lots of fatigue fatigue that their body couldn't tolerate or recover from and as a result of that they ended up getting injured three times over the course of a four-month period that if you're ever going to stifle progress that is the, the, the i guess the most alarming and the quickest way to do it okay so there are three primary issues with training like that and the letter r there so on top of that we're going to cover common training mistakes so there's six of them. First two, easy runs that aren't easy. Hard runs that aren't hard enough. No training structure. Inconsistent training. Not using available training data. And also reactive versus, uh, reactive versus a proactive approach to training. So I'm going to expand on those over the coming slides. So the first one I'm going to start with is that aren't easy. So one of the, this is a, um, uh, I guess a, an extract from our the TCC Instagram page. So this was a post we put together because I was seeing so much of this. So essentially what we're looking at here is, and if you follow my cursor, we're looking at a, a continuous run. So first point I want to make is it was supposed to be an easy run. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit more detail in subsequent slides, but essentially this is the heart rate zone here, 120 to 150 beats per minute. That threshold there, so that white dotted line, across the across the heart rate trace that is 80 percent heart rate max okay so that is 150 beats what we can see here is for the vast majority of this run that yellow heart rate trace sits well above that white line so this particular individual hasn't heeded the advice or followed the prescription they've run 15 seconds per per kilometer faster than prescribed the average heart rate was way higher so six beats higher than the zone one heart rate zone they spent 31 minutes in the junk zone and they also accrued or achieved a max heart rate of 171 for this run. So that is not an easy run. Okay, so when we think about easy runs that are supposed to be completed easy, that wasn't. So that, by virtue of doing that, it, it results in the following issues. That's a, it induces unnecessary and unwanted fatigue. So when you're prescribing an easy run, you don't want to add layers of fatigue. Okay, so issue that's that's a that's a real as uh, a primary issue with this type of approach that then has a negative or, adver or adverse impact on your ability to recover and then that can have an adverse impact on your ability to perform in a subsequent session okay so let's say for example on a tuesday you've got a easy run prescribed you don't do it as prescribed and you do it too hard then that's going to have an negative impact on what is potentially a, an interval session on the Thursday or what is a, or what is a, I guess a, um, it might be a, a race that you've got coming up or, or another key session. So essentially the recovery, the unwanted recovery from this type of run can have an adverse impact. And then the other thing that does happen, and I see this really consistently, it reduces your ability to complete high volumes of running. So when we think about people wanting to train for half marathons or marathons, there's a certain there's a certain amount of volume that needs to be completed to um to actually achieve um, a certain performance in that event or just simply get through the through the event. So by training like this um, repeatedly or incessantly, you do limit your ability to to train at the required volumes. Next one is easy runs that are easy. So this is an, I guess a a nice contrast to look at. So when when we when we look at the the previous slide you'll look at the, so two different runners, so that that's denoted or identifiable by the different heart rate zones, knowing that your zones are determined from your max heart rate. So this was a 40 minute easy run. That was the zone one heart rate. So 115 to 144 beats per minute. And again, if we follow that white dotted line across, you can see here that for this particular individual, they completed the vast majority of the run below 80% heart rate max. So they ran at the prescribed pace. The average heart rate sat below 144. So it sat at 137. So that's perfect. And they only accrued three minutes in the junk zone. So that's that's a that's that's an A plus for that run. The max heart rate was only 147. So that's a well executed easy run. So that isn't fatiguing. That does facilitate recovery. It doesn't compromise subsequent session performance. 
and it does enable higher training volumes. Okay, so we'll expand on this in great detail later in the presentation. Now, the one thing I will note is when we talk about people's, what, what type of training most people do. So when we think about a continuous run, so the type of running I've done, more often than not, people approach it as a moderately hard run. So they'll leave their door, start off at a sort of graduate, like start off at a moderate, moderate pace. And then over the course of a 20, 30, 40, 50 minute run, whatever it is, they gradually increase their intensity. That is how most people approach their steady state or continuous running. Okay, so it becomes from, it comes, like it's sort of progresses from a moderately hard set, a moderate run into a moderately hard run. And by the time they get home, it is probably a hard run or a bona fide, a bona fide hard run. Okay, so when we think about hard runs that aren't hard enough, that isn't a hard, that, that, that type of run isn't hard enough. And the reason it isn't, because when we compare it to actual interval training, you can see the difference. So we're obviously familiar with this one on the left. Now let's have a look at a heart rate trace from a long high intensity interval training session. So it was five reps by three minutes with one minute 30 recoveries. So that's a two to one work to work to passive rest ratio. And we can see here that that dotted red line is this particular individual's max heart rate. The yellow trace is running pace. And then the white is heart rate. Okay, so what we can see here is this is an optimally performed high intensity interval training session. So you can see the difference in, ter in terms of how high their heart rates were, were, how high their heart rate reached and how long they were able to sustain that for, for during this session. And when, I, when we expand on that a little bit further, we can see that by virtue of a good prescription in terms of intensity, also the two to one work to rest ratio, heart rate gradually increases over the five reps. So let's have a look at the gap between that yellow line and white line. You can see when you compare rep one to rep five, you can see that gap really widen. So that's, that's clearly high, highlighting that over the course of those five reps, those five three minute reps, the acute physiological response we expect is occurring. So that, that's a real tick. So that means the prescription's um, accurate and it means the execution's really, um, has been really well done as well. You can also see here, heart rate reaches maximum in the last rep. So that doesn't have to happen, but it did happen in this particular run. And then the other thing that's really, really important to note is that over 14 minutes was accrued over 90% heart rate max. Again, I'll touch on why that's so important, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> a little bit later on. One thing, it's one thing that's really important to note, pace was objectively prescribed. So that means it's prescribed using an intensity measure. So, so essentially when I was prescribing it, I had <clears throat> a very good indication or idea what their aerobic fitness was because we run testing. And obviously we do a lot, a lot of analysis during the sessions as well. The pace remained consistent for each rep. So that's really clear. And that's, 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 a, that's identifiable by looking at the, the yellow lines. <clears throat> and then you can see there, consistent pace, that increases, that, that results in a gradual increase in heart rate. So 14 minutes, absolute tick. That is a well-executed high-intensity interval training session. And then when you do the analysis and say, okay, was that hit session effective at inducing the acute physiological responses we want to improve aerobic fitness? Then yeah, that was absolutely um, that was absolutely absolutely a tick, and it was effective. Okay, so moving on to inconsistent training and training structure. So same tra uh, sorry, same um, profile of um, training data from what we saw earlier. So um, that was very sporadic and, and inconsistent. So that was that was partly the issue, and that partly contributed to to the injuries. At this point, there was no adherence to a training program. If you um, contrast that with this program, so this is a consistent and progressive training program and they are adhering to a training program. So you can see just how consistent this particular individual is. And you can see there, there is a bit of a drop off, but that was certainly a planned drop off based on a couple of, um, a couple of things that were present in this particular individual's life. So obviously when you're devising programs, obviously there's a, phys a physical component that you've got to consider but there's obviously uh, also a cognitive and, and work and social um, aspect that you need to also keep in mind. Not using available training data. So I guarantee of all the participants here, most um, would have quite an expensive GPS watch. 
Um, so here we've got the Polar Vantage V2. So they retail for around $700. So certainly not cheap. Um, the, the one of the biggest issues I see is that a lot of people have these, um, these devices, but don't actually use them effectively. So um, one of the issues is, is these watches, the technology associated with them has um, evolved and advanced so much over the last five years, it's actually quite amazing and quite remarkable. Um, but such simple strategies. So for example, um, the concept of using a, a lap button on a watch, that's been around for probably 20 years, probably even a little bit longer. You'll be staggered how many athletes or individuals, recreational runners that I start working with that actually don't lap their training effectively. So that is something you can control and every watch has that function. Okay, so you don't need a $700 watch to do that. Okay, so, but that's just highlighting that for most people, irrespective of what watch they've got, they don't use it as well as they should. And here's a bit of an example. So this is a similar session. So it's a long high intensity interval session. The major difference here is there's a little bit, um, it's a little bit more voluminous. So six reps instead of five. And the other, the other major change is it's a three to one work to rest over a, over a two to one in the, in the preceding slide. Now, what we can see here is this is data obtained from the Polar Flow app. So we can see here that the red zone is the money zone. So that's where we're, that's above 90%. So remember, um, we're trying to maximize the amount of time spent there. Again, easier said than done, but certainly in this particular instance, this individual did a great job of it. So when we look at this, we can obviously using this technology, so using the watch, using a heart rate strap, using the app, which is freely available on any, with any watch, um, you can basically drag and copy. So capture the, the segments, then that spits out, okay, well, how much, what was your training intensity distribution for that session? So we can see here for this particular bout, there was, there was nearly 15 and a half minutes spent in the red zone. So above, um, above 90%. So again, 15 minutes there, 64% of the session, that is a very effective aerobic fitness stimulus. Okay, so that's just a real, that's just an example of how you can use um, technology and most uh, technology that most people have available really effectively. The other um, couple of points I want to touch on is this concept of reactive as proactive. So most of the recreational runners that I've um, worked with since starting TCC, uh, it's been through a reactive approach. So for example, most individuals have sustained an injury. They've gone to see a physio or a sports doctor, or you know, they've gone to see Andrew and, and a few others at uh, Melbourne Podiatry Clinic. Um, they have um, facilitated and completed some rehab. Um, time has sort of gone on, they've gone back. There might've been a bit of toing and froing, and they've potentially gone back to running unsuccessfully. Um, and sort of, I guess, seeking advice regarding a training programs, um, almost, a, I guess, almost seen as a bit of a last resort. So addressing sort of the root cause of the issue um, probably isn't at the forefront of their mind. So they, they take a reactive approach. So it takes, it takes to the, you know, it takes an injury to, to um, repeat three or four times before they go, well, hang on, maybe there is an issue with the type of training I'm doing. So that's a, that's a reactive approach. And, and that's a very common one. So I guess one thing that Andrew and I've tried to do a little bit better is um, since TCC started, um, obviously we've formed a, a really good partnership and a good relationship and we've had some really um, great success with quite a few um, quite a few individuals that have contended with injuries for, for, for a long period of time. So I guess, you know, in unison, the two of us are able to sort of collaborate, liaise, work with individuals to, to, to not only obviously address um, some of the issues that are present with their body or their biomechanics. And that's sort of what Andrew obviously specializes in, but we, all, we can also complement that with some advice um, regarding the actual training program. So that's where, you know, that, those two sort of complement each other and we get a really good outcome. So hopefully, and, and what we've seen, that sort of results in no further injuries occurring. So again, I'm not gonna say it's 100% foolproof, but certainly from what, what I've seen since starting TCC, this is a much more sustainable model of, um, of long-term training, especially for people that have, you know, lofty aspirations with their running and they want to run really consistently either, either to, to target a specific event or goal or, um, or just because it forms a big part of their, um, their lifestyle. 
Okay, so we've got the letter O there. Okay, so moving on to training intensity distribution and polarized training. Okay, so for those that are unfamiliar, and I'm assuming most of you probably are, so training intensity distribution is the quantification of training intensity, generally using heart rate data to assess the intensity, periodization, and effectiveness of training programs for endurance athletes. Okay, so that's important for you guys to, to understand. The origin, so research, um, there's been extensive research that is that has investigated the, the training intensity distribution for elite athletes across a number of endurance sports. So cross-country skiing, running, cycling, that's just to name a few. So most of this research sort of originated from Scandinavia with, um, with a, lot of, a lot of it coming out of Norway. Um, and the, I guess one point that I wanted to make is why is heart rate data used um, as part of this approach? So when, when you're trying to assess someone's TID, why, why heart rate? So the reason is it's a multi-mode application. So when you think about um, when, when, you, when you try and quantify training um, intensity for, for, for different sports, you can see that, for example, if you compare cycling and um, running, the most accurate way to quantify um, training intensity for cycling is through a power meter, not speed. Because once you throw in wind and gradient, um, speed becomes almost a little bit of irrelevant and power becomes the, must, the most accurate way to get insight into how hard someone's actually working. Running pace is generally regarded as the most consistent and accurate way at the moment to, um, to assess and quantify training intensity. I know there are concepts like the stride power meter, which have been introduced, but again, that's sort of a, a topic, topic for another day. And the other thing that's worth noting is heart rate can be used with almost every endurance sport. So including swimming. So it's certainly a really useful, um, uh, really useful measure when you're trying to assess training intensity distribution. So for most people, when you think about training zones or, or, or training intensity, most people think of this five zone model. Okay, so this is pretty standard. I know it comes um, as a default setting on my Polar, um, Polar Flow app and my Polar Watch. So this is the model uh, most people understand when they think about training zones. I'm going to introduce you to a three zone model. And this has been uh, introduced and coined by um, some of that sort of original research, which was done by a couple of doyens in the field. So Stephen Saylor is one of those. And the reason they went down this, this, this uh, the, the reason I went with this model is that um, this is a model that's based on true physiological demarcation. So what that means is when you think about, and if follow my cursor if you think about that transition between zone one and zone two that there vt1 or lt1 is essentially called your aerobic threshold okay so that's a, that's a key physiological turn point in your in i guess in your body okay so that that's that's really important to note similarly for zone two to three so that transition there this is what's coined your anaerobic threshold okay so this is when blood lactate sort of um, starts to quite rapidly rise um, so that's, that's again, based on a true physiological uh, marker in your body, okay? So that's why this model is regarded as a more accurate model to determine what's actually, got, what's happening internally within your body. Here's a bit of an example of how this data can be used. So this was a, a cycling case study that I did, and you can see it was completed over 21 weeks. And what you can see is I've used this graph to basically collate how much time was accrued or how much time was spent in each zone over the course of 21 weeks. Okay, so that's, that's really interesting. So what you can see is the vast majority, um, for the vast majority of those 21 weeks, the, the vast majority of my time when I was cycling was spent in zone one. Okay, so that's really good. And again, I'll talk about, I'll expand on that um, in subsequent slides. You can then see the next highest amount was certainly zone two. Okay, and then the smallest amount was zone three. So again, interesting, that's the highest intensity. Remember, that's the money zone. Um, but again, we'll talk about how you balance all those different intensities um, over the course of this webinar. So um, which training intensity distribution model is best? Okay, so this is, a, this is an overview of the eight different models. Okay, so this one, we've obviously already 
covered and touched on a little bit. So that's the threshold model. So that's what that running looks like. But we go all the way from A through to, through to H. And you can see that there's really quite varied approaches to training. So there's lots of low intensity. There's lots of high intensity. There's lots of training in the middle. So yeah, the question is what TRD model is best? So it should be no surprises to anyone based on what, based on what I covered as some of the common training mistakes. What does most people's TID look like? So for most people, it looks exactly like this. So it's a copious amount of time spent in zone two. So that's that moderately hard junky zone. That is where most people spend the vast majority of their training time. You can see that's complemented by very little time in zone one and very little time in zone three. Again, we, we don't need to cover this in too much detail because we have we've already touched on it, but it results in increased fatigue, increased injury risk, increased training monotony, increased susceptibility to illness. And then if you complement that with, or if you, if you accentuate that with the fact that it results in an inferior acute training stimulus, and then that results in inferior chronic aerobic fitness adaptation, that's not a great model to train with. So that leads to the question, is there a better way? So there is some advice around, um, this polarized model. So that researcher I referred to before, Stephen Saylor, he's, he's done extensive research in this area. So this is a model that he's, he's certainly strongly advocating um, alongside this pyramidal model. So when you look at these two, you can see there's two things that have happened. The main one being the, for both of the models, there is a big shift in um, training time spent in that middle zone. Okay, so that's really important to note. So the, there's that, zone two time is getting reduced. And then for, for both models, you can see there's a, most of that is getting shifted to zone one. So if you think back to that case study, where was most of that cycling training done? It was zone one. So that, that sort of makes sense. And then depending on which model you adhere to, there is uh, an increased amount in zone three, but the extent of which depends on whether you would, ad you would adhere to a polarized model or a pyramidal model. There are some um, nuances of its application, but certainly that's beyond the scope of today's webinar. We just run out of time, but certainly they're, they're recommendations. So when we think about polarization of training, in a nutshell, it is make your easy sessions easy, minimize time spent in the moderate zone or that threshold zone and make your hard sessions hard. Now you're probably thinking, well, where's the evidence, where's the scientific evidence to, to, to support these claims? Because I actually quite enjoy training uh, as I do in that moderately hard zone. So this is a research paper that looked at um, a few different training models. So polarized, high intensity interval training, threshold and high volume training. And what they found was unequivocal. The polarized intervention resulted in the greatest aerobic and performance improvements when compared to all of those other um, training models. So they looked at some key performance markers. So they looked at time to exhaustion. They looked at those thresholds. So remember we spoke about aerobic and anaerobic threshold. So essentially they're looking at what speed can you run at for those in those at those thresholds. So ideally with anyone trying to train for 5K, 10K, half marathon, marathon, the whole point of this training is to shift those thresholds up because that means you can run faster for longer with less fatigue. So that that is what that's in a in a nutshell what people are trying to trying to achieve by by training for those events. This is particularly relevant when we look at that when we look at it, look at it when compared to the threshold intervention. So we can see here seventeen percent, nine percent, eight percent, five percent threshold six two one two. So big difference. So I'm not going to spend the rest of the webinar just covering scientific literature because it probably won't be that exciting for most people. But I, I just want to point out another couple of studies just to reaffirm um, th this concept and, and sort of hopefully get it to really resonate with you. So this is one that was really interesting. So they looked at the training intensity distribution during an Ironman season. So, and then they, they, the, one of the key things they did was they related to competition performance. So when we think about Ironmans, they are interesting events because when we think about um, now you guys have uh, have a bit of a exposure or a bit of an insight into TID, you'll, you'll identify that. And for people that have done a, an Ironman before, they'll understand that you spend most of the event in that moderately hard zone. 
So for, for most people, when they think about training for an Ironman or, or, or a marathon, for example, they'll think, oh, well, it's specific to train at that intensity. It's, you know, it's sports specific, it's event specific. Yep, that's fine, it might be specific. But what this study found, and it was really groundbreaking to be honest, they found that triathlon performance was correlated to TID, but it's not as you think. It is increased zone one time. So basically the more time spent in zone one, that increased triathlon performance or Ironman performance. In contrast, those individuals that spent more time training in that middle zone, in that threshold zone, in the junk zone, that had an adverse impact on Ironman performance. Okay, so very counterintuitive, but again, just keeps adding credence to, to this model. And then the last one is and probably more relevant for everyone here because yeah, there's probably lots of passionate recreational runners um, in, in the, obviously in the attending the webinar. So it does polarize training improve running performance in recreational runners. Runners, yes, it does. So what we've got here is uh, time on the y-axis, and we've got 10k pre, 10k post. So for a lot of people, a 10k race or event is such an achievable goal. So it's a really popular event to train for. Um, and what we can see here is. I'm, I'm highlighting that the polarized model resulted in a much more significant improvement in 10K time over the same period of time compared to a threshold model. So um, the, the PET was training in that middle zone. Okay, so again, hopefully I've added some, some scientific rigor to, um, to some of the evidence I was providing earlier. So you might be convinced, why aren't more people training like this? So. If it were that easy, everyone would be doing it. So easy running requires um, really good knowledge of your appropriate training zones and thresholds. The other thing it requires is discipline, restraint, and patience to temper your intensity and heart rate when running. Trust me, when you're doing easy runs occasionally, and it, can, it, can, it might be you've had coffee beforehand, so your heart rate's a bit more elevated. It might be you're running in heat. It can be really challenging to keep your heart rate down. So it does require a lot of um, restraint and patience. Conversely, hard running requires mental toughness to contend with pre-session anxiety and nervousness. So for people, and again, there's I know there's a few that are that are here that have obviously adhered to some of the sessions I've prescribed, that they do um there is an element of anxiety associated with it because they are hard. So people people have that little bit of feeling, um, you know, a bit. It sort of sits in their stomach that they're like, okay, this is going to be a tough session. How am I going to get through it? So there's that certain certain there's a certain level of mental toughness required to to contend with it. Um, and there's also an ability to tolerate mental strain and physical discomfort when you're doing the session as well. So not only do you have a little bit of anxiety pre-session, but when you're doing it. Um, there's, all, there's, there's clearly discomfort that you're trying to contend with as well. So all of that though culminates in when you do it successfully and most people do because the sessions are prescribed really accurately. When you do it, you have you know, an immense um, sense of satisfaction by getting through those sessions. Okay, so last few little points. <clears throat> so why high intensity interval training? So when we look at peer reviewed literature and I could, I could sort of toggle through this for, for, the, for the rest of the webinar and I'd find research which supports it. But essentially um, peer reviewed research advocates the use of high intensity interval training for, to improve aerobic fitness more so than continuous training and fartlek training, um, where, particularly when you're working with intermediates and elite athletes. So that's really critical, okay? So it's really important to note that for, for novices, Almost any training works. You could do circuit training with with some with some resistance training equipment, and you probably would ma marginally improve your aerobic fitness. But as you progress, as you are more consistent, the the level of stimulus required to improve gets much more rigorous and much more arduous. So that's where high intensity interval training becomes a much more viable option. So why is that the case? So when we think about the actual concept which underpins it. So we are trying to maximize the amount of time spent at or near VO2 max. So if you think back to a few of those slides I showed previously, it is, um, we use sort of 90% heart rate max as a bit of a guide. So when we try and achieve a certain amount of time there, that is positively associated with your oxygen consumption. Again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but essentially what we're looking at is, this is a, this is a comparison. So we've got oxygen consumption on the Y axis, We've got time on the X, 
and we're comparing interval training versus continuous. So interval in the white triangles, continuous in the black squares. So I'm not going to bore you with the, the nuances of this, but essentially what we're looking at is the interval training protocol enable this particular individual or this group to spend much more time at or near VO2 max when compared to the continuous running. So that is fundamentally critical to aerobic fitness improvement or improving VO2 max. So same thing, but for most people, they probably um, have a better concept of aerobic fitness. Okay, so integrating HIT into a periodized program. So can you get too much of a good thing? Absolutely, yes. So more HIT doesn't equal improved performance. So when we look at those models, they both sit around 20%. So 20% of your training time should be spent there. So when you think about it, that's a lot of time. So 80% or so that you have to spend elsewhere. So whether it's in the easy zone, some of it in the threshold zone, there's a lot of time that's spent elsewhere with, with only a small portion of your training week spent at a high intensity. And then for us, HIT forms an integral part of our conditioning philosophy. So HIT type, volume, intensity, that is all individualized based on athlete, target event, training objectives, and training status. Okay, so that's, that's really important. So the, whole, the question I get asked a lot um, is what HIT session is best? So there's no such thing. It requires so much context um, to, to actually answer that question insightfully. So, so it, 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 yeah, it all depends on those factors I've just mentioned in the slide. And each of the HIT sessions is tailored based on all of those, all of those training variables. So last couple of slides for me, because I'm uh, very quickly approaching the end of my slot. Um, so I just thought I'd give you a bit of an overview of what TCC looks like and what we provide from a running program standpoint. So we provide individual running programs and we also provide running plans. So um, individualized running programs, are certainly for runners that want to target a specific event, and want a program to accommodate their individual needs. Um, obviously, this is particularly relevant for people that are returning um, to running from injury because that's a huge consideration and has a big impact on training volume, intensity, et cetera. Running plans, we have, um, I guess we've just remodeled a lot of these um, more recently, and we've got um, three different options. So we've got the beginning, which is essentially um, devised for a beginner. So if someone's just started running, and they really require a bit more guidance and structure, that's a perfect program for them. There's also a program that targets a 5K event or just someone that wants to work up to running 5K continuously or, or in, as part of a session. There's also a, a similar program for, for a 10K um, event or a 10K target. The other thing that's worth noting, um, all of these plans come with some injury management um, aspects in there and also access to TCC's member access area which sits on our website. Um, and last slide for me, so to, to find out a little bit more about it. So essentially the individualized running programs, they're devised and distributed um, every month. So they are four week objectively prescribed programs. Um, that point there around objective is, is absolutely critical. So essentially the prescription is absolutely tailored to, to the individual based on knowing your um, capacity and fitness levels really intimately. So that's really important to note. That gives you um, the guidance and accountability that a lot of people need. Um, it is tailored to the individual, individual needs, clearly. The only thing I would say on that particular program is there is a limited capacity because they take a lot of time to put together. Um, and by virtue of that, they are a bit more expensive, but we're very happy to um, obviously reduce the price for the attendees of this webinar. So um, ordinarily they, they um, $185 per month. So we're happy to do $170 per month for people that, are, that have obviously attended this webinar. And then our running plans are, I guess, our less expensive options. So they are six week objectively prescribed programs. So despite the fact that they're a plan, not an individualized program, they are still objectively prescribed and they cater for a wide variety of fitness levels. So there's basically five levels that are catered for across the programs. Um, so they cater for basically anyone um, and there's some real clear guidance around how to, how to follow the program. Um, obviously they can be target events or target distance, which I've already touched on. So again, last, last point I wanted to make as part of this webinar and, and again, to say thanks for attending, we're really happy to, um, provide a, a, I guess, a really significant discount on those. So normally they're $75 uh, 
um, for, for each six month block. Um, so we're, we're going to do those for $55. Yeah, for, sorry, for a six week um, objective, objectively prescribed program. And uh, if you want to find out a little bit more, we do use Instagram um, to provide a bit of education. So that's certainly one thing that I've tried to do, um, tried to do through, um, through that platform. Um, so yeah, obviously if you're interested, um, give it a follow. And then we've also got a website there and also our email if you're interested in contacting us. Cool. Thank you all for uh, listening and um, I'll stop sharing, hand over to Andrew. Thanks, mate. If you can just make me <clears throat> host. All yours. Cheers. Yeah. All right. So thanks very much for that, Nath. That was a really uh, interesting insight. And I think everyone who runs can gain some really, really valuable information from that. Next letter up is B. So just quickly, um, before we get to uh, Brad and Renee, um, I just thought quickly just chuck in the um, chat box. If you tried to change something with uh, the way you run, whether it be your running technique, uh, what have you tried to change um, and how did you go? So, Yep, so we've got a few people who've come up with since high knee drive, tried to make cadence faster and found it so much more tiring. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, increasing cadence, there's a few people, high turnover. Yeah, so basically running gait assessment is what, you know, why do we do it? It's obviously to get a good understanding of what's going on with someone's running technique, given that's obviously a really fundamental part and it can play a fundamental, fundamental com uh, part in running injury. Um, Obviously, we use it to reproduce the symptoms to try and find out where an injury is exactly occurring. And often we use it as a bit of a detective work to find, look out for clues of what we need to investigate further, whether it be some strength testing that we need to do, whether we need to have a look at some flexibility, so some right joint range of motion, uh, and there may be some uh, asymmetrical issues. So we may find that one leg's doing something different to the other, and that may be... Um, a reason why an injury is occurring. And obviously it's also very difficult to treat an injury if we can't see what's happening when someone's actually running. So for people who are running, it's really, really important that we look at what's going on when they're running, given that's by far and away the most likely um, time when they're developing their injury. In most cases, if it ain't broke, we don't fix it. So everyone's got a different running technique. That running technique is, is a factor of your anatomy, your skeleton predominantly yes there's a definitely a learned um, factor to this but really what we are trying to have a look at is trying to get that person running as optimally as they possibly can for them so what can we change um basically some really common injuries can be treated with just simple running technique changes so things like uh, knee pain anterior knee pain like runner's knee itb um, syndrome shin pain are really often can be, you know, particularly in their early stages, can be uh, increased or you know, improved or eliminated by just simple things like decreasing stride length, increasing the knee flexion at impact um, and foot strike position. So changing how, where the, and how the foot's landing relative to the body. Um, and Achilles tendon and calf issues, um, also really common running injuries can be, we can address some of them by managing the load more, by changing things like the stride length, reducing the time the foot spends in contact with the ground and activating higher up the chain in the glutes. So with a running gait assessment, you know, what does it look like? Well, we obviously do it on a treadmill generally and we film it and we have been using, getting people to film it outside a lot more with, um, with telehealth. Um, it's basically a video running gait assessment and the ability of running a video is that we just have the ability to slow it down and look at multiple views. 
we can obviously compare pre or post. So if we've made a change, we've implemented a shoe, uh, pre and post injury, we can compare. We often give running cues on how to just look at changing running technique, things like cadence, if you've already measured, mentioned knee lift, arm position, so trying to avoid the arms swinging across, which often brings the hips round. So really simple things that can make a big difference in not obviously, not only reducing injury risk or managing injury, but also can be uh, really great at improving performance. One of the things that we've been playing around with and implementing in the last 12 months is the run scribe technology. We're finding that's a really good way to get some real qualitative data of what's going on with the runner. You can see here, it gives us so much information in terms of the foot strike position. Um, it looks, looks at efficiency, so it compares things like step rate, contact time and flight ratio, and works out basically how efficient a runner is. The beauty of this is that we can give this technology, these little pods that go on your shoe to a runner and say, look, go away, do a couple of your runs with this, bring them back, and we can actually then interpret that data and see what's happening in in uh, when they actually are running, not just on a treadmill. Um, so often to try and understand what may be happening, say early versus late in a run, we can get some really valuable data with this. So um, if anyone is interested in having a bit of a look at this, we're more than happy to um, chat further. Uh, and we can certainly look at um, getting you to, to uh, trial this technology. So the next letter we've got is I, and that's gonna take us into um, having a, a little bit of a chat with uh, Renee and Brad. So Renee and Brad are um, based at the running company in Yarraville. Um, if you don't know um, where they are or what they do, they are a specialty running shoe store. Um, they really know running shoes. They know running footwear. You're not gonna just be uh, put in, uh, grab a shoe off the shelf and, and see how it goes. They will actually discuss with you in detail what's going on with your running your running history um, and have a really good look at um, your running. I've got the awesome um, ability to have a look at your running because they've got a treadmill there. So, uh, and plus they've got years and years of um, knowledge. So I'll bring them in. Um, g'day guys, how are you going? Hey guys, how are we? Good. Um, so, well, I thought let's kick it off. If you'd like to um, chat to us a little bit about uh, I'll just head back to that. But if you'd like to chat to us a little bit about um, what the latest trends are, say in the last sort of 12, 24 months with running footwear. Yep. Um, I suppose uh, like, which, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, technology um, coming out at the moment in terms of all your racing shoes. And um, that has been I reckon, for the last um, year to year and a half. Um, it's actually just getting better and better, to be honest. Um, but I suppose the biggest trends that we're sort of starting to see as well is the fact that a lot of our, you know, stable, structured shoes are veering away from those, using those really sort of strong dual density foams, um, which create a lot of control and sort of um, rigidity underneath the foot and, and moving more to your sort of more natural feel um, cushioned and um, sort of more flexible foams in a sense. There's, there's still, when I say flexible, it's not like you can bend them in half, but there's still a lot of structure that, that sort of sits into the back of the shoe, um, but obviously something that's gonna be um, more effortless and, and sort of less noticeable underneath the foot. Um, in terms of the foams um, and the technology, um, everything's getting a lot softer, a lot bouncier. Um, we're moving away from having really structured and a lot of overlays in through the uppers, um, less sort of uh, heel count and external heel counters. So they're, they're becoming um, more minimal around the foot. So which all these things sort of take away a lot of the weight out of the shoes so that they again feel a lot lighter um, around the foot and yeah, a lot more comfortable. Um, in, in saying that, there, there is some compromise in terms of what comes with the, the shoes now with um, longevity of them, I think, and mm. the purpose of shoes. So um, the trends that we're seeing is, you know, we're really finding that we do have 
um, a, a lot of purpose in terms of what the shoes are meant for. Um, so, you know, like those stable neutral models that are, are that core range of shoes that we look at and they're continually putting on people's feet and, you know, we're, we're somewhat um, a bit spoilt in terms of we can add in a lot of cushioning, a lot of um, features into the shoe that feel um, super comfortable without increasing the weight. Um, but in terms of that, the longevity of that it, it is somewhat compromised um, because we do have, you know, less uh, sort of um, structure around the foot that provides, a, you know, that heavier, more structured feel, but then also um, a little bit more of that longevity in those shoes too. So what, what sort of mileage would you generally expect to see from most of the shoes now? Um, so you, you, we sort of, um, we're always sort of sitting around that sort of five to 600k mark, would you say? Yep. So I say, um, every, there are shoes that all, um, it's give and take in terms of which shoe we are actually using. So obviously you are going to have these um, bracing shoes that are now using these different um, like foams under the foot that are, are not going to be as durable as some of the everyday shoes. Um, but yeah, realistically, we're saying around that sort of fixed five to 600 Ks in the everyday sort of training shoe. Um, people are going to vary there in yep. terms of, you know, how they load, um, like what they're like and what they're using them for, if they're wearing the whole day. But yeah. yeah so there's, there's a lot yeah. of factors that come into play in regards to how long the shoes are lasting these days. Um, I mean, like Renee just touched on, how often they're in the shoes, you know, the body type of the person that's, you know, that's wearing the shoes mm. as well. So it's, yeah. it's hard to put a, like, I guess, a specific number on how many kilometres you get out of the shoes. Um, it really depends on, you know, yeah. Yeah, the models that they're in and, and yeah. obviously what they're using them for. So normally, well, in the past, when you'd go into a running shoe store, there was very clear delineation between your stability shoe and your neutral shoe and it was kind of like you're one and if you're a stability runner you would never ever be caught dead in a neutral shoe and vice versa what what have you seen now certainly from my point of view i've seen there's been a bit of a shift in the thinking around that if someone comes in now um to get fitted for a shoe what's your what what are you sort of looking at um and and how do you, you know, arrive at the shoe that they end up walking out in well, a lot of it comes down to sitting down and just having a good conversation before we even start looking at shoes. Um, mm. You know, tying in with what Nathan was sort of saying earlier, every individual is different. You know, we see your novice runners who have literally taken up running in the last 12 months because, as you said earlier, there's been nothing else to do. Um, we get a lot of walkers that are, you know, just in for a good shoe just for walking, not just necessarily a running point of view. So uh, a lot of where we, I guess, go with the shoes comes back to the conversation we're having with the customers, you know, like I said before, we even put a shoe on their foot. Um, we do the, the you know, a, a basic sort of gait analysis. So we'll have a look at them running barefoot on the treadmill. Let's see what your feet are, go um, see what your feet are doing. Um, let's look at what, you know, specific requirements you need in a shoe for the, the volume of running that you're doing, um, how often you're running, where you're running. Um, so again, there's a lot of variables that come into play. Um, I mean, too, like, I mean, the, the biggest part is seeing where they're coming from in terms of what shoes they're coming in yeah. with as well. So the, the gait side of things is, is very secondary, I, I think is, is very important what we say to people when they come in. Um, you know, like I said, we're, we're sort of looking at a lot of the injuries that you see are very um, load-based and, and training errors. We agree with that. Um, so, you know, when we're looking at that footwear, the things that I think that a lot of people um, compromise on is the fit of the shoe and, and you know, the sizing, you know, the width the depth, um, all these sort of areas. So we're looking at those parts and in the shoes that they're coming in with, how it's actually fitting on their foot. Where are they getting that wear pattern? You know, are they getting any injury concerns? If they're not getting any any injury concerns, then the shoe is, you know, it might look terrible on their foot. Like where about to remove them? So I think it's always a make, about making subtle differences and finding models that we think are going to complement the types of training that they're doing um, and feel really natural around the foot. Um, a lot of interest in the carbon plate shoes out there. Um, what do you see their role is um, in in either you know in running generally? Like how, how do they? Where do they fit in the in the in the? When when should someone wear them or? Yeah, the, yeah. Look, yeah. there's there's obviously a lot of hype and a lot of talk about these. You know, I guess they're basically casting them as, as super shoes. Um, funnily enough, we actually had a, a, a Zoom call this morning with um, Jeff Johnson, yeah, um, cool. Nike's first ever employee. Um, and, and one of the interesting things he said is, well, why wouldn't every runner want to be in a carbon plated shoe with these ridiculous phones in them that allow us to run further, run faster, fatigue less um, and recover better? 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess that's where the excitement is, is, is in those shoes at the moment. Um, all the brands are, you know, bringing out the ways that they, they want yeah. to do it, whether it be a full carbon plate, um, you know, or a, or a, or a five pronged approach, to a, you know, approach yeah. to a carbon plated sort of shoe. Um, but the advantage of running in those shoes is uh, like A, to put them on, they just feel ridiculous. Um, and it's, you know, they have the advantages from your, your, your 5K park runner to your, you know, to, to your elite marathon runner. Um, so it, in store for us, it's, you know, they're always the fun shoes to bring out and, and let people put on their feet and mm. have a try. So I think that comes down to they are, the excitement's generally there. Um, they're, they're shoes that um, still need to be educated on. <laughs> so I think that the biggest part is that um, we have found people using these shoes as their everyday runner. Um, and I think that being in a carbon plated shoe for everything is, not good um uh, you know obviously there's there's certain i mean i suppose when you talk about the the latest technology in shoes it's all that rocker geometry as well so you know, you're pretty much getting that everywhere um mm. whether you're taking out that carbon fiber plate or you're just having less flex screws and a more rigid forefoot so they're definitely across the board from your you know your more structured and your stable neutral shoes versus your racing shoes um but yeah i think that they are exciting they can be worn by your novice runner all the way out to your elite runner um, regardless of where you're sort of at but they just need to be used appropriately and for the right sessions Um, but I mean they're always going to complement someone that's trying to run faster and if you want to run fast they're always going to feel better yeah and I guess lastly where do you see obviously with the changes where do you see the shoes heading to in the next couple of years we talked about that a little bit. We did, morning, yeah. yeah. Look, yeah. Well, it's it's infinite, isn't it? Really. I mean, how far they've come in the last you know, five to ten years. It's um, it's going to be very interesting to see where shoes go. Um, they were actually talking this we were talking this morning that, 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 that there is talk around you know um, these high energy revert, return foams that they're producing that are actually going to produce more, more energy, energy return than we what can, the body can actually produce. <laughs> Yeah, so I suppose when you look at it and you, you look at those things and where they're trying to take um, take the technology and the shoes and what they're trying to provide the runner, um, it's only going to get better. So and it's almost a little bit like weird to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> where does, where yeah. does it end? But again, it's, it's, it's got to happen first. But and, and where they are at the moment, I think that we're really nailing it and, um, you know, and you know, we are a store that is very passionate about um, at what we do and, and how we approach things. And we don't have that bias towards brands and styles, but, you know, we're so happy to see that there's, there's a lot of brands that are going across the board that are producing like amazing shoes that we have the option now, instead of sticking with one super shoe, you've got three or four different mm-hmm. pairs and you've got some different tiers, like you've got your training shoe versus your racing shoe. And, you know, you, mm. you can really um, educate and, and provide the runner with some really awesome tools. <laughs> yeah, great. awesome. And I think I think it just goes to show like it's really really important that you you do get that advice around the shoes. So you know I can certainly vouch. I was wandering past the store on um, on Monday and could see Brad having a very detailed sit down chat with a with a customer. So it really is that extra little bit of service that you can get to make sure that you obviously walk out of the store with a shoe that's hopefully going to perform and um, to your to your needs as a runner. So. Yeah. Right. Um, give them a follow too on um, Instagram. They've got some great um, little insights in, in, in footwear. Um, and yeah, I can, I can certainly recommend um, if you you know want a little bit more advice. Um, they are suggesting at the moment, um, just make sure if you do want to get your shoes, good, if you do just jump online and, and book an appointment, um, but you will get uh, basically the full service and you can obviously spend the time with them to get the shoes. So thank you very much. Guys, um, so I thought just quickly, um, I know we've gone a little bit over, but we will, we will get to the questions. We probably obviously don't have too much more time to answer questions, but if you do have any questions, um, we'd love to hear what your top takeaway is. And please let us know. Top takeaways, we'll, um, we'll, we'll pick a couple out and send you a pair of Steigen socks. So please pop them in there. We'd love to hear what your top takeaway was from the session. Um, but please, in the meantime, pop some questions in there. What we'll do is um, we will 
whoever it's relevant to, I'll um, forward all of these questions on. So if it's a, a training question, I'll give it to I'll forward it on to Nathan. If it's something to do with running, um, your running technique or um, running injury, I'm more than happy to answer them. Or if it's for Renee and Brad, I can forward them on to you and they can, um, if you've got any specific shoe questions. Um, I love so far some of the um, feedback coming through. Easy runs aren't always easy and treat easy runs as easy runs. I think uh, that was probably for me mind blown when I first uh, realized that and I was as guilty as everyone for doing too much in that threshold zone. So um, yeah, I hope you got gained something out of um, Nathan's talk. Um, it's, I think, rethinking the way that you're running um, to not only improve your performance, but reduce your injury risk is um, a really, really uh, a valuable. And I hope, hope you've all um, learned something from that. So the last letter is C. So pop it in the chat box. We'll be in touch with the winners um, to let you know that. And thank you again to Renee and Brad for very generously um, uh, offering those up for the winners. Um, as I said to you, please, I'll, I'll leave this open for the next um, few minutes. So please, if you've got any questions, um, I might just quickly, Nathan, if you want to just um, jump on, I've just got a quick question that came up. Yep. Um, <clears throat> someone was basically uh, looking at, was wanting to know, um, hang on. Someone was wanting to know about like, how do you do factor in breaks within your training uh, throughout your training schedule? Do you factor in sort of like easy weeks effectively? Yeah, great question. Um, so absolutely. So uh, I guess the concept of deloading or unloading is, is really important. Um, the extent of which really depends on um, the type of training that someone's doing, um, how consistently are they training, what intensity are they training at, what are they preparing for, so, for example, it could be, you know, for, for most people, sort of a week deload generally provides a pretty good physical and psychological um, benefit. So that can often be the extent of it. Um, for people that have dug a, a sort of a deeper hole and, and have, you know, pushed the envelope a bit more, um, they might require two weeks. But also, there's, you know, it is worth considering that, like, for example, um, in terms of the, we haven't even touched on periodization of training at all today. If you think about, uh, I give someone's a, a consistent runner and is targeting specific events, then there's certainly periods where um, like a full month devoted to just easy running is absolutely a viable option because that's that sort of sits within your um, your, your global periodized plan. So, um, and, and then by virtue of doing that, you know, you have the opportunity to increase your volume, but in terms of the, the I guess the, the stress associated with that type of running, it is lower. So yeah, that's another way you can sort of offset training intensity and training load. But yeah, absolutely, definitely do it. It is highly advantageous. Um, the frequency, I think the frequency of it and the length of it really just depends on on um, the type of training you're doing. So it's hard to give like a, a specific time and how often and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, Renee or Brad, um, I've got a, someone's just asked, do you need to, Break. what's your sort of recommendations around breaking in a new pair of shoes what do you normally tell customers good question well i almost sort of say that um throughout that i suppose how we go through our fitting process essentially we want them to be choosing a shoe that feels quite natural um and that's what they're leaving in um we're always um uh, sort of making subtle differences so unless there was something that was uh, like a massive difference from where they've come from um that we're making some big changes where I, like i suppose we're, we're saying we're going to have to gradually ease into something like this um normally we would say you should be able to go out and, and go running in your shoe there shouldn't be any issues um so there, there's always that question around breaking them in i yeah. think each individual mentally sometimes they might feel like they have to wear it a little bit more for some smaller runs but yeah. i think that only comes down to whether or not we have any concerns in what we've changed in the footwear i guess generally speaking though we would recommend a new shoe you use it for one of your shorter runs yes. you know early in the yeah. week um, rather than going out and chucking it on your, you know, Sunday long run sort of straight off the bat. So, yeah. Yep. Awesome. Well, as I said, um, please continue to pop questions in. Um, we will sort of endeavour to uh, answer them all um, uh, individually. Well, I won't take up 
any more of your time. I'd like to thank everyone for um, jumping on and having listened. I hope you again took something out of it. If you've got any questions you'd like to book in for a running gait assessment or test out our RunScribe technology, you can just hit me up at my email, andrew at melbournepodiatryclinic.com.au. Just mention the running assessment in the subject line so I know what it's about. Or you can just head to our website, uh, online bookings um, available, and you can just mention that you attended the webinar to take advantage of that no gut running assessment offer. Please give us a follow on Melbourne Podiatry on Instagram. We hopefully provide lots of just simple, useful tips and advice on running, running injury, um, and often we'll integrate some great information from um, guys from the running company or Nathan um, as well. So um, thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Renee and Brad. Um, Thank you. Uh, great uh, presentation. Hopefully we've provided some in, uh, useful information um, we will make this uh, presentation, uh, a recording of this presentation available. So if anyone uh, did miss it or wants to share it with their fellow runners, um, we will uh, be in touch in the next couple of days to share this with you. But thank you all so much and uh, enjoy your running. Uh, and we hope to see you running around soon. Okay. Awesome. See you guys. Thank you guys. Bye.